Well guys, I finally made a prototype x-ray machine using one of these uh, 2x2a tubes. It's a half wave rectifier vacuum tube, but as you may have already noticed, I broke it. So <laughs> I can't show you my x-ray setup just yet. I ordered two new vintage tubes off of eBay for much, much cheaper than I got this one from the United Nuclear. But there's one problem. I am really impatient. I don't want to have to wait three to four days before I can start playing with x-rays again. I want them now. So I was thinking to myself, I need another vacuum tube to abuse. And then it dawned on me, I have one. Let's see what we can do with this magnetron. All right, so I've successfully stripped down the magnetron and here is the vacuum tube that is inside of every microwave magnetron. It's a pretty looking thing, it's all metal, except for some those nasty beryllium oxide insulators on the very ends, which you do not want to break because you definitely don't want beryliosis. Um, that's one of the big hazards of screwing around with magnetrons, so I wouldn't try this at home if I were you. Now, there is some heat sink left on. Um, I left this on just because it was really difficult to get off. I don't know if it's spot welded or press fit on, but I just couldn't seem to get it off without putting a dangerous amount of force on that tube, so I left it on. So now, over here, I have my prototype high-voltage DC power supply. It has two voltage settings, one for high voltage and one for very high voltage, and obviously this is just a prototype, hence the huge rat's nest of wires. So over here we have two fluorescent light ballasts, which drive the flyback transformer. One is a two-light ballast, and the other is a four-light ballast which is where I get the two power levels from. I didn't expect them to behave like this, but well, they did. Those directly drive the primary coil of a flyback transformer, no center tap, and voila, we get high voltage out of the anode and connect it to the cathode here. So let's see if we can generate some x-rays with this magnetron. Okay, so the power supply is plugged in and so we're gonna put around 30,000 volts across this tube. Um, I don't actually know the exact voltage that this power supply puts out. I'm still working on rigging up an analog panel meter to measure it, but I know it's at least 20,000 on the output. So I'm going to switch it into its higher power mode. You can see some LEDs there on the relay turn red as the Inputs and outputs are simultaneously switched from those uh, those fluorescent light ballasts. All right, so let's see what we can do. I've got my Geiger counter over here. I have severely abused this Geiger counter. It is not in good shape. Um, you can see there are some damaged pixels there, and uh, the counts per minute reads above what I know to be the background here, so this thing's on its way out, but oh well. Um, I've wrapped it in aluminum tape just to hopefully prolong its life a little longer, but it's still not very happy. Alright, so let's set the Geiger counter here. We are going to power up the tube. Hear that high voltage hiss, and now my Geiger counter is a little quiet, but let's listen. At least 3,000, nearing 4,000 counts per minute after putting that close to the tube. So, this generates a pretty fair amount of x-rays. You might have noticed that the greatest area of x-ray emission, according to the Geiger counter, was somewhere in this area right here, sort of behind the heat sink. The reason that the x-rays are concentrated in that area is because of how the internals of a magnetron tube are shaped. If you were to look down the end of a magnetron tube and take a cross section, this is what you would see. This is how most resonant cavity magnetrons appear on the inside. 
There are several resonant cavities which allow the electrons emitted by the cathode to oscillate in a manner that produces microwaves. I've connected my power supply to the magnetron tube such that the filament and the cathode are both connected to negative and the anode is connected to positive. This is how it's normally connected inside of a microwave. However, I'm using far higher DC voltages. The high DC voltages applied to the tube create a strong electric potential between the inner cathode and the outer anode block. This electric potential causes electrons to be accelerated out of the cathode, through the vacuum within the tube, and into the anode. When the electrons strike the anode, they are absorbed in a way such that the kinetic energy of each electron is converted into X-rays. The diagram on the right illustrates a cross-section of the magnetron tube perpendicular to the first cross-section. As you can see, the copper anode blocks take up a large amount of volume on either side of the cathode. X-rays generated as they strike the anode block are less likely to exit the sides of the tube because they have to travel through all of the copper that makes up the anode block first. However, X-rays may escape diagonally as they only have the wall of the tube to go through instead of the entire anode block. This is what leads to the uneven, or in other words, anisotropic radiation pattern of the X-rays. Here's what the radiation pattern of this magnetron tube looks like. Okay, so we've proven that a magnetron tube can indeed be used to generate a fairly significant amount of X-rays with a high voltage power supply. Hope you guys enjoyed the video. I'll see you next time.